We're going to be talking, as you know, about the First Amendment and animals. The First Amendment covers a lot of territory. We're talking about speech, we're talking about religion, we're talking about big, big stuff. And we're going to cover it all. And so we're going to talk really fast. And it's going to be an amazing panel. I'm very, very excited about it because we have two of the, just the leading experts in these topics talking about this. And I'll just give you a brief intro before we get started. Justin Marceau is, is a professor at the Sturm College of Law at the University of Denver. He has clerked in the Ninth Circuit and served as an assistant federal public defender specializing in capital habeas corpus appeals. He has, uh, he also continues, while he's a professor, he continues to actively practice law as counsel of record, as a consultant, and as an expert witness, and he litigates and con consults for the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Jim Ole Oleski, and you know, I was supposed to ask you how you pronounce your you, name, and I didn't. Did I get it right? right? Excellent. Jim Oleski is a professor at Lewis and Clark Law School, and before joining the school, he served as special assistant to President Obama and chief of staff of the White House Office of Legislative Affairs. During his time at the White House, Professor Oleski worked on legislation ranging from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. He was the 2014 recipient of the Leo Levinson Award for Excellence in Teaching, and his research focuses on the intersection of religious liberty and other constitutional values. So this is going to be a great panel. Panel, and uh, I think that Justin, you're going to you're going to start off talking about speech, and let's sure. get started. Thank you. Well, thank you to Marianne and Jim and ALDF and Lewis and Clark uh, and everyone who's helped put this on, and for being here this morning. Um, as Marianne mentioned, I'm going to talk just briefly. It's a, it's a big topic, but I'm going to talk briefly about the intersection between speech and animals. And um, on the one hand, it seems that free speech, constitutional free speech, would have very little to do with um, animals as such, as, as non-human beings. Um, and I was reflecting on that just this morning, and I was thinking, you know, it is interesting that the First Amendment um, prohibits abridgments of speech. Uh, it doesn't limit it to persons or people. And so uh, someone like Steve Wise would be, would be interested in that omission, I think. Um, it's, it's sister amendments, it's neighboring amendments. You know, the Fourth Amendment is the right of the people to be secure. The Second Amendment is the right of the, uh, a person to bear arms. Um, the Fifth Amendment, uh, I forget how the Third Amendment is worded, also a person or uh, owners of homes, I guess. The Fifth Amendment are these sort of people being free from uh, double jeopardy. Uh, and so the First Amendment, by its terms, actually could protect, I suppose, in theory, communications of chimps, of whales, of dolphins. Um, it could, right? It's a, a legislature abridgment of those abilities to communicate might be something we would think has uh, constitutional footing. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today, and I mean, that might even be more interesting. But the, the reason that that doesn't get traction are the sort of things we don't talk often about at these conferences, which is just a sort of prudential standing, right? That. Um, I mean, we can talk about ways to win in animal cases, and there are many, um, but there are far more ways to lose. And so uh, one of the ways to lose in those cases would just be a recognition that courts typically have said that even when statutes are directed to protect animals, like the Endangered Species Act or the Marine Mammals Protection Act, animals themselves don't have rights, the right to litigate those rights, right? So you have to have a person that's injured, um, and it's sort of a, a statutory standing type requirement. So it's not realistic to talk about animals and free speech in that sense. Um, but on the other hand, um, what's very realistic and what's very practical is understanding the relationship between um, the First Amendment's protection of free speech and I think the animal rights movement or uh, the protection of animal interests more generally. So. Um, what I want to do is just touch on a couple of areas of animal speech and uh, hopefully put it together into a narrative that shows how the First Amendment is sufficiently complicated and overlapping that um, our intuition is sometimes wrong about what should happen, or at least if we want one thing to happen, how that might impact another area. Uh, and so I'm going to look at um, animals in art um, briefly and egg egg laws very briefly and maybe hunter harassment statute. So I'll try to draw some connections between those three. Um, but as a way of kind of tying this together or a prefatory way, let me just say that I think, um, and this isn't my own insight, this is really uh, Mark Tushnet and Jack Balkin's insight, but they have both written persuasively about 
the role of the First Amendment in defining social movements, right? That um, when a movement is new, when it is not in the majority, when it's not part of dominant culture, um, it's often speech and protest, soapbox, whatever it is, that puts them, that gives them a platform, right? Justice uh, Black, I think in 1943, famously said that, um, I think it was leafletting, yes, leafletting is essential to the poorly funded causes of little people. Um, and that sounds, uh, I think, overly patronizing and horrible. But what he meant is, you know, speech is really how you get your message out. And maybe that's changed a little bit with the internet, but it's the sort of ability to communicate with others when you are outside of the dominant culture that has, that, that's sort of where the power of the First Amendment is. Um, and I think that every movement, I mean, this is probably, uh, you know, I don't think anybody has written this book, but I think almost every social movement has suffered from the defect of getting to a point or a point of stature um, of relative uh, success within the, the dominant culture that they then turn on free speech at certain times, that they say, well, we don't need it anymore. Uh, we don't like this marketplace of ideas so much anymore. Uh, we've gained enough acceptance. And maybe the case in point at present times is Planned Parenthood, right? Um, the Planned Parenthood litigation, there is not a single organization in the country, including um, factory farms that are fighting harder against uh, undercover investigations at the moment than Planned Parenthood, right? Um, they have, the National Abortion Federation and Planned Parenthood have a very famous and I think important history of speech and successful speech. Um, and right now, um, you know, both through campaigns and litigation, litigation including a request for a prior restraint to prevent video recordings from being released, um, which was granted uh, amazingly by the Northern District of California. Um, you have sort of weird bedfellows, uh, and so it's an odd time. Um, to their credit, um, you know, some, I think, staunch uh, libertarians and pro-choice folks have intervened in some of those cases and said, look, this is, look, I'm very pro-choice, but um, cutting off investigation is not the way to go about it. And I think one particularly uh, significant brief in that regard, if you wanted to look at one, is, is written by a professor at UC Davis, um, Ash Begwatt. He's a First Amendment scholar. And he wrote a brief sort of on behalf of Marianne Glendon, among others, um, sort of advocating the position that uh, we could all actually agree that whatever you think about the merits of this guy, uh, what he's saying, and whether it's def defamation or not, um, undercover investigation is, is something that we should protect. So um, moving to art and sort of putting this in the context of animals, um, what does it mean to say that animals can be art? Um, we're all aware of cat videos. We probably love them. Um, and, but beyond cat videos, uh, I think it's obvious and even intuitive for people that um, art plays an important role in our culture and that art is protected um, by the First Amendment. And even more importantly, that art serves um, a role as challenging um, dominant culture, that art is okay, that it's protected, even if it does things that offend, right? So um, flag desecration, I think it's probably, I, don't, I haven't seen polls on this, but I imagine that most Americans still really don't like to see the flag being burned, but very few at this point question that it's a, it's a speech right, right? Um, and so um, artistic efforts shielded by the First Amendment, they, they even enjoy protection when they shock most of us, they appall most of us, right? This is, this is not particularly controversial at this point. Um, the KKK parade, the um, film depicting physical or sexual violence, um, I, I think it probably makes many of us uncomfortable, um, but that doesn't make it um, outside the parameters of the First Amendment. And this is true um, to a certain extent of animals as well, uh, although within limits. So some of the most, uh, in my view, repulsive um, quote unquote art has been done in the, in the name of, of, well, I'm not sure what in the name it is, but, but using or relying on animals. Um, perhaps most famously, many of you have probably heard of crush videos right, made famous by the US Supreme Court, which are just as horrible as they sound, essentially, um, I guess for sexual gratification, stomping on animals with high heels or boots, um, chickens, dogs, rabbits, um, as a form of, of art. Um, another is a famous artist, I think he's still living here in New York City, who adopted a dog outside of Denver um, and made a film called The Shot Dog Video, and it's shooting the dog and watching it die. Um, several artists, I mean, this is, this is sort of almost mainstream at this point, kill cats and do various things with their corpses. Um, another example was 2000, a, an art exhibit in, in Denmark, um, they put goldfish in blenders, and the artist was there, and you could sort of choose to push the blender on or not, 
Um, I think it was supposed to make a statement about morality or your morbid curiosity. And of course, there's images and videos of what happens when you uh, push the, the button. And we heard a little bit about the intelligence of fish yesterday. Um, there's also supposedly one or more exhibits um, that involved sort of street dogs being brought into museums and then um, food and water put just out of reach of them on a leash and people would come and watch a starving dog. Um, so if art is speech and the examples above are art, then all of the, is all of this protected by the First Amendment, right? It's certainly a far cry from the cat video. It's a far cry from even putting your cat in a costume, which she doesn't like, by the way. Um, it's none of those things, right? Um, so is it all protected speech? And I think that probably the, the, the good news for everyone is hoping that it's not, it probably isn't, right? Um, and the reason is that speech protections are not unlimited, of course. And the most important, um, if not most discussed, limit on speech is actually um, the side constraint that I think Jim is, is more of an expert on than me, of general applicability, right? That um, there are laws of general application that are not designed to limit speech. Um, and those laws are um, fair checks on otherwise sort of morbid and disgusting behavior. So what is a general law? Um, well, I think the, the sort of paradigmatic example might be murder, right? You cannot murder someone on the set or on the, uh, the theater screen because um, you're making art, right? It's, it, we, we have murder laws because we don't like people killing each other. Uh, and so despite the fact that you want to make a statement or engage in speech, um, this generally applicable law is a, is a forceful and important side constraint on that. Um, now, the difficulty, and this is, I think, part of where Jim's work picks up, is defining generally applicable versus you know, um, not generally applicable is tricky, and that's where I'm going to go. Um, but the general point, I think, is best stated by the, the court in U.S. O'Brien, and this really responds to those art examples I just gave. The court said, we can't accept a limitless variety of conduct will always be speech when the person involved intends to express an idea. And that, I think, probably resonates with most of you. Uh, I hope it does. Um, but as we'll see, that has ramifications for other areas of the law. Um, the other sort of quick comment I want to make about art is, um, initially, the Congress um, criminalized crush videos in a statute that, as many of you know, was held unconstitutional, it was overbroad. Um, we can talk about why later, but the, but the basic thing was that the statute was held unconstitutional because it swept in too much conduct. Maybe it included hunting videos and the like. Uh, so the court struck it down. Um, in a sign of sort of congressional consensus on animal cruelty, at least, if nothing else, um, they amended the statute. And now, I mean, it still has, it doesn't just say crush videos, but it essentially is targeting crush videos, sale, distribution, exchange, and so on. So. Um, the Fifth Circuit is the only federal circuit to have taken up an appeal that I'm aware of um, addressing the constitutionality of that statute, and it upheld it, right? It said that this statute, this ban on crush videos as crush videos was constitutional. It didn't offend the First Amendment. Um, and the reason the court said is, is sort of twofold. One, they said, well, even if it is content-based, um, it's really a um, there's good reasons for the statute that, that don't require strict scrutiny is in that they were trying, the legislature was trying to prevent animal suffering and pain and torture, and that's a good thing. And so in doing that, we actually look at the, the secondary effects of this law. We look at sort of, sort of secondary effects doctrine, looking at not why, was, was there a purpose in suppressing speech, but what good things come from this. Um, and that was the dominant, the dominant rationale for the holding. There was a, a subsidiary one that's takes a little bit more time to unpack. But um, again, I think that most people would applaud that result. But what I will ask in just a moment is to reflect on what that result has, has wrought for other litigation. Um, when you accept that sometimes content-based laws won't be subject to strict scrutiny, um, strange things happen. So segue to the ag gag laws. Um, many of you are probably aware of their basic structure. Um, in a broad brush, oversimplified form. Not all statutes have this, and um, you know, some have part of it. But the, the, the defining features are really bans on recording and bans on misrepresentations used to gain access. It's sort of those two um, um, forms of conduct or speech, depending on your, your uh, perspective. Those two things are what are, the, are, are driving egg egg laws and are the, are the basis of the challenge. Well, um, what do you suppose the states in defending ag-ag laws would say, 
they say things that uh, resonate very much with the art debate we were just having. So, for example, um, a dominant argument by uh, both the state of Utah and the state of Idaho, as well as to a lesser extent the state of Wyoming, has been these are just laws of general application, right? Um, sounding back to the very principles that protected animals in art. And so this is resonating with a general law of application preventing um, interference with one's privacy, pre preventing trespassery type action. This is a law of general application. Trespass, you can't challenge First Amendment purposes. This looks a lot like a new form of trespass. Um, they have also argued that um, recording videos um, in private um, is just not a sort of speech that is protected, right? And how could that be? Well, they point to, among other things, cases like um, crush videos where they might be able to say, well, there's not very many cases about video recording in private. And those cases that have come up have tended to find that it's not protected speech, or at least not wholly protected speech. Um, so we have this general applicability rule, which is acting as a good constraint, arguably, to prevent certain forms of art as passing as art, um, but it could play a role. If the egg egg laws are upheld, I think that that's um, one of the most likely defenses. I mean, if you look at what uh, Eugene Volokh and others have said, they said, well, but you know, this could be framed at a slightly higher level of generality as a law of general applicability, then maybe we don't, the, you, know, you don't see these victories. Um, and um, you also see these arguments like we saw in Stevens that even if it is um, content-based restriction, we should set that aside and do something different. This should be a unique speech case because the interests are so important. Just as we argued that the interests in preventing cruelty were so important, the state is now saying interests in biosecurity, interests in food safety, interests in a supply chain are so important that uh, if we do anything uh, in this case, we should recognize that even if this is speech, it's a special speech case and create some exceptions. So um, there's this tension, right, between advocating for our animals in art and perhaps looking at what some of those arguments might bring in other litigation like ag gag. Uh, and so the last thing I want to do is juxtapose that with a separate line of cases, uh, which is uh, one that I think most folks on the left, certainly if you, if you judge by headlines, uh, viewed as a bad decision. So a case that recognized um, a speech right in a context, uh, in the context of abortion buffer zones, so abortion protests, right? Um, this is the McCullen versus Coakley case from 2014. And the reason I want to look at that is I don't think most people think of that as related to animals at all, and in, in some ways, non-human animals, that is. And in some ways, that's, that's apt. Um, but in another sense, if you think about what that case decided, um, I think it has, has relatively great um, transferability. So put this in the context of hunter harassment laws. For those of you who don't know, um, most, certainly most states that have an active hunting, um, you know, the, the, in the West where I reside, hunting, hunter, hunter harassment is a, is a, is a well-established and, and uh, important principle that uh, I've even had hunters invoke to me as though it's, you know, of constitutional magnitude. It's this idea that uh, it is a crime to intentionally interfere with uh, what they call the lawful taking, the lawful hunt, right? So if somebody is there to hunt and you're interfering with it, um, then you would be a criminal. Um, and there's been, of course, these are not new statutes for the most part. There's been dozens of legal challenges, most of them fall failing. And most of them fail because the courts say that hunter harassment is a law of general applicability. It's just not about speech. It's about this bad thing that we try to prevent, like murder or like rape. It's just, you know, attacking a hunter. And this is the slippery slope with speech, right? And so most of the cases have gone that way. But I think that the game might be changing slightly with a case that made many of us probably uncomfortable, which is McCullen versus Coakley. So what does McCullen hold? Well, McCullen was a challenge to uh, Massachusetts um, buffer zone around abortion clinics. It, in essence, created a, a 35-foot uh, safe zone where you could not approach folks um, who were entering an abortion clinic. Um, really for any reason, right? It was, in that sense, truly content neutral. You could have been there to tell them, go for it, or please don't do it, um, God will judge you. It doesn't matter what you were going to say if you were there, and in fact, you didn't have to be intending to speak. Just the fact that you knew you were within 35 feet of an entrance was enough, right? That was enough. Um, and the Supreme Court said, um, <coughs> excuse me, this is unconstitutional. Um, the, the content um, based inquiry is a little bit more cumbersome, but the, but the at the end of the day, what the Supreme Court said is, 
Um, this buffer zone restriction unconstitutionally impedes the ability to speak on matters of significance. Well, um, if that's true, if a buffer zone outside of an abortion clinic is unconstitutional, uh, at least one that makes you stay 35 feet away instead of eight feet away in Colorado, um, then what does that mean? Well, it might well mean that these hunter harassment statutes that make you stay far further than 35 feet away are constitutionally dubious, right? And think about it this way. Abortion is a constitutionally protected right still today. Um, hunting, as much as it is beloved, is not a federally constitutional right uh, at all and is, is only rarely a state um, protected constitutional right, not as much as it is a statutory right. So um, to the extent that we're protecting otherwise valuable activity, which we need not debate, um, the prohibition or the, excuse me, the unconstitutionality of hunter harassment laws um, calls into question whether we can also sort of shield hunters from speech that they may not like to hear, persuasion, leaflets, all of those things, which probably do fall within hunter harassment statutes. So uh, my point to close then is not that all hunter harassment laws are obviously unconstitutional, though I think many um, may very well be. My point is not to suggest that limits on animal art should be abandoned in order to better serve some other um, litigation goals. Um, but my point is that the First Amendment has historically been connected to social movement success. Um, and you know every good totalitarian government knows that the best way to destroy civil society is to pull away free speech. Um, and so when we advocate for limits on speech or expansions of speech in this movement, we don't do so in a vacuum. And I think we should be cognizant of that. Since, since both of our speakers are experts in the other subject, we're going to um, offer them an opportunity to respond, to add a question, add a comment. So Professor Oleski, do you want to start with that? And then after that, you can get into your talk on religion. That sounds great. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first of all, if you haven't had a chance to read the brief that Justin provided to the uh, conference as part of uh, the materials, I highly recommend it. So you know, sometimes you read something, and the whole time you're reading it, just issues are popping in your head as you're reading it. And that was my experience in reading this brief. And I'm just going to tick through a few of the different ways in which that was so. The content-based versus content-neutral issue, the issue of whether something's a regulation of speech or conduct, and where the crossover or line between those two things is, how we treat misrepresentations for purposes of free speech law, uh, how we treat misrepresentations for purposes of tort law and trespass, uh, the issue of is the baseline for trespass the common law of trespass, or is it can legislatures in different states change the baseline? High value lies versus low value lies, a very intriguing idea. So it's just an enormous amount of things to talk about in, in these this litigation that's going on. And this is a brief on the ag gag laws. Um, so trying to pick just one thing to ask about is tough. I guess the, the theme of animal law issues, or I should say issues litigated in animal law cases crossing over with other animal law cases and maybe coming out differently, and the issue of those same issues coming up in completely unrelated contexts, um, and how to uh, account for that and think about that strategically, I think is really important. And I'll talk about that in, in my talk. The, I guess the question I have is the speech conduct issue is one that's also being litigated right now in a lot of these wedding vendor cases some of you may have heard about. These involve uh, wedding vendors who do not want to provide services to same-sex couples. And one of the questions is, is you know, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, is that conduct or is that speech? And is forcing people to provide services they don't want to provide compelled speech? And then there's also often things associated with the refusal of service that may be look more like pure speech, like advertising that you don't provide certain services. And I think that's in an area in which this, the line between speech and conduct will likely be litigated in the coming years. I'm wondering if that has played in, at all into your, your thinking or if you have any thoughts about that particular issue. I, I realize it's outside the context of animal law. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think um, I haven't thought of it in this frame, although not for any particularly good reason. I, I mean, I, I would say that I think um, my, my general view is, is evolving towards the idea that um, sort of more capacious view of what counts as expressive and communicative conduct, that the O'Brien or Spence line of cases 
strictly dividing conduct and speech is increasingly not what the court is talking about anymore. And that I and I think that's probably correct. So the example that I would use is, is Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. And this, this is a case about material support to terrorism. And um, so in one sense, this should have been a very easy case for the court because it's can you give advice? Can you um, give training or money to a terrorist organization? It wasn't about can I give a speech as a speech, right, a political speech. And what the Supreme Court didn't do is say, well, this doesn't implicate the First <coughs> Amendment. Instead, um, they gave it strict scrutiny, right? And so I didn't talk about Holder, but I actually think the Holder holding has potentially helpful implications for us in the ag gag case to the extent the state wants to characterize this as conduct and conduct that is um, not speech, because if Holder gets strict scrutiny, then certainly we must. But then on the other hand, I think that Holder, if read that broadly, has troubling implications for our ability to limit uh, um, you know, other things that we were talking about, dog torture as art. Um, I mean, it may well satisfy strict scrutiny, but if you have to give it strict scrutiny, I would be, um, I would be scared. Um, as to whether you know, this, you know, the refusal of um, a business that's put itself out there to provide services is engaged in speech by refusing service, um, I mean, that seems like, farther than I would be willing to go. Um, not only is it commercial, I think, or at least intertwined with commercial um, speech and thus less, I also think that um, that sort of arrangement, you know, over a commercial transaction or refusal to do business, um, it just doesn't have the same trappings of speech. You know, you, you have seen and noted, I mean, we're talking, uh, and it's one of the reasons that in the Egghead case, we're always looking for limiting principles, right? I mean, this is recording that has, uh, this is not, this is not a case about, or these are not cases about, can you record someone in the restroom? Can you record someone in their home? And I think these lines are important to draw. And likewise, these, this distinction between lies that might serve truth or might serve to improve our knowledge about the political system or the food system versus um, lies about um, you know, your credentials. And so, I mean, I would probably put it in the same framework, but it's a, it's a good, uh, particularly given the, the tone of my talk, it's a good uh, reminder that uh, we probably need to reflect more on some of that stuff. Do you want me to just go ahead and get started? That would be great. Or? Okay. So uh, let me also thank the conference organizers. It's just a real privilege to be here. And thank you all for coming out on a Sunday morning to, to listen to us talk about these issues. So I'm going to talk about a, a different free exercise, uh, sorry, a different First Amendment right, the right to free exercise of religion. And so 23 years ago, the Supreme Court decided a case that I'm sure you're all familiar with, Church of the Wakumi Babalu IA versus City of Hialeah, which I'm just going to refer to as the Wakumi case. Uh, for ease of use during this. And in one sense, the Wakumi case was an extraordinarily simple case. And in one sense, it was an extraordinarily complicated case. And let me explain why I say that. Uh, on the simple side, if there's one thing that everybody on the court, and I'd say everybody in the lower courts agrees on with respect to what religious liberty protects in the Constitution, it, it protects against government targeting us based on our religion. And so to the extent the court unanimously found in Church of the Wakumi Babalu IA that what was going on was that the city there was targeting members of the Santeria Church, uh, it was an easy case. The reason it's extraordinarily complicated, though, is that the court basically said, this is an easy case for us, and we're not going to explain what might happen in the harder case. And so let me explain and why it's a, there may be harder cases is a little convoluted and complicated, and I have to do a little background on the court's free exercise jurisprudence. So in 1990, the Supreme Court, in a case called Employment Division versus Smith out of the state of Oregon, uh, changed its approach to the free exercise clause. And the court over the years has bounced between two interpretations. Everybody agrees, as I mentioned earlier, that the free exercise clause of the First Amendment protects us against government targeting us because of our religion. The controversial question is whether it also grants us a right to religious exemptions or accommodations from laws that aren't necessarily targeting us. And the example I use, and for those students who have heard me use this example before, I apologize. The, the example I use is, let's say, on the one hand, the state of Oregon passes a law banning Catholics from using sacramental wine. That is a nine to zero violation of the free exercise clause if it went to the Supreme Court. By contrast, imagine the state of Oregon passed a law just banning all use, sale, and distribution of alcohol. Well, that has the effect 
of prohibiting Catholics from using wine as a sacramental matter. Um, and the question is, well, do they have a right to religious exemption from the law or a religious accommodation? The court for a very long time took the position the answer was no. Then between 1963 and 1989, the court took the position that the answer is yes, unless the government can meet strict scrutiny to deny the exemption. And then in 1990, the Smith case I mentioned, which involved sacramental use of peyote by Native Americans, uh, the court said no, there's no right to religious exemption or religious accommodation. The free exercise clause is about protecting us against government targeting us based on religion. But the court re declined to overturn any of its precedents that found a right to accommodation or exemption in the past and attempted to distinguish all those precedents. And that has led to enormous confusion. Uh, one of the ways, and, and the key way for our purposes here, and the key uh, way for purposes of animal law that the court distinguished its prior jurisprudence is it said, although there isn't a general right to religious exemption or accommodation from a neutral law, you may get an exemption if government has a mechanism for granting exemptions and doesn't extend it to religion. And then some lower, and that's one of the ways they distinguish prior cases that had recognized a religious exemption. And then lower courts have taken that and said, well, maybe it's not just having a mechanism to grant individualized exemptions that triggers the potential right to a religious exemption. Maybe if a law just has categorical exemptions written into it, that triggers the right to a religious exemption from the law. The Supreme Court hasn't decided that. Lukumi gives mixed messages, I would argue, on uh, that issue, which leaves it open to advocates to be arguing in the lower courts where exactly the line is between a law like the law in Lukumi, which the court concluded was gerrymandered to prohibit no animal killing other than animal killing by this particular church, and an across the board ban on all animal killing for which there'd be no religious exemptions. What about most laws which fall in between those two extremes? Most laws have some exemptions in them or some contours on their coverage that make them under-inclusive to a certain degree. In which of those cases, if any, is there a right to religious exemption because those laws are under-inclusive? That, that is the outstanding uh, question. And there have been three cases in the federal courts of appeals that have addressed this issue since Lukumi, uh, two of which are animal law cases. But one, and this is the one that got the farthest, it was petitioned for cert at the Supreme Court. This court denied cert this summer, but three justices wrote a dissent from the denial of cert and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, that third case involves emergency contraception. So arguably nothing to do with animal law, but if the court had decided the free exercise issue in that case, it would have enormous impact on the ability of states to enforce animal cruelty laws uh, in cases of animal sacrifice. One message I just wanna send as a takeaway, and I, I wanna say it now before I forget, is that the animal rights and animal welfare communities were extraordinarily involved in the Lukumi case. I think it was 18 organizations uh, joined five different briefs in Lukumi. Um, in, with the benefit of hindsight, that was probably not the right case in which to do that work. Um, possibly as a reaction to what happened there in the 9 to 0 decision in that case, the community was not involved in filing amicus briefs at all in one of the cases that's come up since, Merced versus Casson, which is a case was decided by the Fifth Circuit um, in 2006, uh, or uh, the Stormins case, the emergency contraception case I mentioned, in which an enormous number of amicus briefs were written in the Ninth Circuit, and then at the cert stage at the Supreme Court by advocacy organizations obviously involved in the issue of contraception and abortion, uh, but also religious liberty advocates but as far as I know, no briefs were filed by anybody um, from the animal rights or animal welfare community. And I think that may be a missed opportunity, and I'll, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So just briefly an overview of these three cases I mentioned that have touched on this issue. Uh, none, of it, none of them have resolved it definitively uh, since Lukumi. The first was the Merced case out of the Fifth Circuit. And, and this was interesting because it also involved a practitioner uh, from the Church of Santa Maria, who was doing animal sacrifice in his home. And the, the key difference between the Wakumi case and the Merced case, at least from my perspective, is that unlike Wakumi, where what happened was the church came to town, started doing animal sacrifice, the city quickly, in response, enacted these four ordinances that seemed gerrymandered to only prohibit the killing by the church. 
in Texas, in, this, in the city of Euless in Texas, um, what was at issue were animal welfare laws that had been in the book decades before the church and the members of the church had come to town and had been enforced against other people. So there was no argument that they were adopted with the object or the intent of discriminating against the church of Santeria. Yet, uh, religious liberty advocates who push a broad view of what I call the selective exemption rule, the idea if there's an exemption in the law, you may have to give a religious exemption and take the view that if there's so much as one exemption in a law, you have to give, that's comparable, you have to give a religious exemption. They argued in the Fifth Circuit that the Merced case was just like the Lukumi case and that language in Lukumi uh, meant that the practitioner who was sacrificing animals at home in a way that others who were doing them for secular purposes mostly would not be able to do, that he was entitled to a religious exemption. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there were no briefs sort of from an animal law perspective, and there were actually some really interesting and difficult issues, animal law issues in the case that really there wasn't an informed perspective given on in the case at all. The case ended up getting decided not on First Amendment grounds, but on RIFRA grounds. It's a state RIFRA, it's a Religious Freedom Restoration Act that explicitly grants a right to religious accommodation. 21 states have such laws. And so the, the Church of Santeria member prevailed invoking state RIFRA in that case. Um, but there had been an enormous amount of discussion in the briefs about the First Amendment issue. Uh, the second case was a case called Black Hawk versus Pennsylvania out of the Third Circuit, a decision written by then judge, now justice, Sam Alito. And in that case involved the keeping of a black bear by a member of a Native American church. And it was a complicated case, but the, the piece of it that's most relevant for animal law purposes is that uh, there was a permit fee requirement. You had to pay a permit to keep wildlife in captivity. And Blackhawk uh, petitioned to have it waived. And one of his arguments was, there's an exemption in the law for zoos and circuses. If you're not going to require zoos and circuses to pay to keep bears in captivity, you can't require the religious practitioner to keep bears in captivity. Even if you can enforce the permit fee against everybody else other than zoos and circuses, you can't enforce it against me. And he won on that argument in the Third Circuit. So what prevailed in that case is what I would call the broad version of the selective exemption rule. If there's an, you know, a single categorical exemption in a law that undermines the purpose of the law at least as much as the religious exemption would, you have to give the religious exemption. Even if there's no evidence of discriminatory intent, that when the zoos and circuses exemption was put into the law years earlier, there was no evidence that it was put there in order to discriminate against members of the Native American church who were engaged in religious practices with bears. Uh, the final case is the emergency contraception case I mentioned, a case called Stormans versus Weissman out of the Ninth Circuit. It, this case, again, had a lot of complications. Much of the case was litigated as if uh, it was a Lukumi type case where really what the state of Washington was doing in passing rules that require pharmacies to dispense all FDA, uh, all FDA drugs was really they were targeting people who had religious objections to Plan B and other emergency contraception. So a lot of it was about the intent of the state of Washington and they were really going after religious uh, objectors. But there was a broader argument in the case, which was even if the re from the religious adherence perspective, the owners of the pharmacies who had religious, religious objections to providing Plan B, even if the state isn't discriminating against us, doesn't have the purpose of discriminating against us, the law includes some exemptions, some categorical exemptions. One of them is that pharmacies don't have to dispense drugs if they don't get their customary payment. So a pharmacy can decide not to take Medicaid. And so then patients can't get drugs because uh, they don't, uh, the pharmacy doesn't take Medicaid. That undermines the purpose of the law, so says the religious here, adherent, much more than require, allowing one religi religiously owned pharmacy to decline to dispense Plan B, particularly in a city in which they were in, in which five other pharmacies nearby would have dispensed the Plan B. They made that argument to the Ninth Circuit. They lost in the Ninth Circuit. So the Ninth Circuit did not adopt what the Third Circuit adopted in Blackhawk, the broad version of the selective exemption rule. Instead, the Ninth Circuit takes the position that the whole, if you grant an exemption, you may have to give a religious exemption rule, is just a tool for sussing out cases where there might be intentional or purposeful discrimination. And so if the exemptions are granted under circumstances where it looks like it might be indicating that government is valuing some secular reason over a religious reason, for violating the law, then maybe that's a problem.
but lots of laws have categorical exemptions. Not all categorical exemptions are going to trigger a right to religious exemption, rejects the broad reading of the selective exemption rules, goes up to the Supreme Court of the United States. The court denies cert this summer, I think in part because some of the other factual complications in the case, and also because they're divided 4-4 right now uh, on issues like this, or potentially divided 4-4, I should say, on issues like this. So it goes up to the Supreme Court. Justice Alito, who again wrote the Black Hawk case, adopting the broad interpretation of the selective exemption rule, descends from the denial of cert, joined by the Chief Justice, joined by Justice Thomas, arguing that the Medicaid, the customary type of payment exemption to the Washington pharmacy rules that would allow a pharmacy to turn away a customer because uh, they don't accept Medicaid triggers an obligation to give an exemption to the religious pharmacist who wants to not dispense Plan B. So at least three justices of the Supreme Court have indicated they would take a broad view of the selective exemption rule. That, if that view became the majority view on the Supreme Court, it would make it extraordinarily difficult to enforce any animal welfare law in the United States against a religious practitioner because pretty much every animal welfare law in the United States has categorical exemptions um, that undermine the law, at least to the extent that an exemption for a religious practitioner uh, would. All of which is to say, I think it would be good if in the next case that goes to the United States Supreme Court or the next case that goes to the circuit courts raising this issue, um, courts may be made aware of the consequences for animal law of a broad versus narrow selective uh, exemption rule. And in fact, I was a little worried my paper might, I mean, not my paper, my talk might be uh, a little stale because I'm mostly talking about Church of the Lukumi Babalu, which is a pretty old case at, at, at this point. But just this past week, uh, a lawsuit was brought in California challenging a practice by some uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish practitioners of waving a chicken above the head and then slitting the chicken's throat. Uh, it's a practice that previously has caused a lot of controversy in Brooklyn. In 2014 and 2015, efforts were made to try to stop the practice. Uh, and then this year, a suit was filed just the last week in the state of California. And in fact, this is interesting, the complaint explicitly raises Wakumi sort of on a preemptive basis and says, we know the practitioners are going to argue that their conduct is protected by Wakumi, but it's not, is the, the argument in the complaint. So it's teeing up precisely the case that's been the source of all this confusion over whether or not uh, there are religious exemptions must be granted to animal welfare laws. I will say, I, I don't, haven't had a chance to see how many organizations are, are involved in this litigation at this point. It doesn't seem like a lot. A cautionary note. Some of the language that was used in the, the publicity around the lawsuit and in the lawsuit itself is similar to the language that was used by some organizations in, uh, in Wakumi. So one thing that was said in the complaint itself is that this practice was done uh, in the guise of religion. Uh, another one of the, some of the publicity around the 2014 and 2015 lawsuits here in New York called it a foolish custom. Uh, one of the older complaints from either 2014 or 2015 said, although Judaism is 6,000 years old, uh, the, this practice has only been around since the 10th century. <laughs> These arguments, as, as one of my former bosses say, get an F in federal court. <laughs> They get zero votes on the United States Supreme Court. And more importantly, they play into the idea that there might be religious bigotry going on. So one of the things that was said about the Church of the Wakumi Babalu, that they are uh, a bloody cult that has no legitimacy and no place as a religion in the United States. That did not help the cause in the United States Supreme Court because that reinforced the idea that this was a case of religious discrimination. Um, so on the one hand, I think there's some danger signs about some of the language surrounding these cases. On the other hand, this is the first case I've seen that sort of explicitly raised and recognized that Wakumi is at the heart of uh, these questions. And it is going to be an avenue in which to litigate these issues. So the reason it's a live issue in California is that the law there prohibits intentional and malicious killing of animals. And that's the, the claim that's being brought uh, against this, the practice um, of Kaparos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. And there are exemptions in the California law for hunting, for food, and for research. 
Now, those exemptions weren't enacted in response to this practice, and so there's no indication that they were enacted intentionally to discriminate against uh, the Jewish practitioners of this particular practice, like the ordinances in Lukumi seem to be in response to the practices of the Church of the Lukumi Bablu. Um, but they are very broad exemptions and undermine the law arguably much more than allowing this particular religious practice to go forward. So this issue, if this litigation goes forward, this will be one of the cases in which the courts will have an opportunity to um, develop the contours of the selective exemption rule. Now, it's in the Ninth Circuit. Um, so that is, for those who favor a narrower view of the selective exemption rule, and I would submit for animal cruelty, the, the sake of animal cruelty laws, that's probably the approach uh, that would be most favorable to promoting enforcement of those laws. The Ninth Circuit takes a narrow view of the selective exemption rule. This will go through the Ninth Circuit. Um, but there could be a case in New York and, and in the Second Circuit. I, I don't think the Second Circuit has taken a position on the selective exemption rule. So all of which is to say this is going to be a live issue in the years ahead. I think it's flown a little bit under the radar in recent years, um, and, and I would urge people to, to take a look. Thank you. Professor Marceau, do you want to uh, make a comment or a question, and then we'll open it to the floor? Sure, just a couple of quick ones. I would be interested in, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating topic, and I was, I was thinking, even as you were talking, that if the broad exemption rule took hold um, through an animal case or through um, a you know, birth control case, then as a sort of thought experiment, what do you think would happen to cruelty codes? So on the one hand, of course, there are exemptions that Pam and others have documented. And so in that way, it seems that there would be, as you said, a religious exemption from cruelty uh, would almost certainly be the law. And I wonder then what would happen, whether that would be an absolute bad or would have some good effects. Because legislatures, I mean, cruelty codes are so popular right now, right, that we have felonies in every state. So what would happen if we um, had a Supreme Court decision that said, well, now effectively, every religion can have an exemption from cruelty. They can sacrifice dogs, they can do whatever they need to to goats, like any, you know, swing chickens. Nothing is off the table. Um, would legislatures come back and amend their cruelty codes to say, well, it only applies to dogs and cats and there are no exemptions? Um, would they do something that looks more like what actually happens in practice, that there is no protection for farm animals? Or would we be in this limbo where we say, well, it's really too bad, but religions have an exemption? And I, I don't know if you have a, a thought on that, but I would, I mean, I just think it's an interesting thought experiment because of the way cruelty codes are enforced. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating question in terms of what legislatures would do. I mean, I, I think the chances of, let me put out what I, I guess the possibly ideal result might be, which is, so you have uh, the Supreme Court say, that these religious practices can go forward any time there's any exemption to an animal cruelty law, well then one reaction could be we're gonna get rid of all exemptions and all animal killing is gonna be banned. Um, if, if a legislature, and maybe more likely a local ordinance is because it's complete bans are more likely to smaller your geographic area. So let's say a particular community that felt strongly about this decided we're just gonna ban all animal killing. Um, in that jurisdiction then there'd be no exemptions and it could be enforced at least under Smith. Now, I should hasten to add that it's possible the Supreme Court will revisit Smith and yet again flip its view on the free exercise clause and recognize a general right to religious exemptions. So, so just be aware that that is also out there as a possibility. And, well, I'll hold on that thought for a second. What's more likely, I think, as you, as you posit, is what if the legislatures say there's certain categories of animals that we're going to provide complete protection to, while there's other animals we don't? Well, that's one of the fascinating and confusing things about Lukumi, because Lukumi kind of looked across species and, you know, seemed to indicate that you allow killing of any type of species, that undermines your ban of killing of other species. And, you know, taken to an extreme, you know, one of the things I, I mentioned in the paper is, uh, you know, if you, if a state doesn't ban the boiling of lobsters, does that mean it can't regulate the treatment of dolphins? Um, that, and that issue hasn't been worked out at any level of sophistication. It's an issue I think creates controversy 
within the animal welfare and the animal rights community as to what, how we treat different species differently. But the courts right now, to the extent they're doing any of this work, and there were some issues like this in Merced, the case in Texas, um, because one of the issues was does allowing the killing of rodents by homeowners undermine the interest in prohibiting killing and slaughter of um, larger mammals. And the only people weighing in on that issue were the religious liberty advocates in the city of Euless. Um, and, but I do think very difficult issues about how we treat different species and how that impacts how we, the, the contours of the, the laws that applies to other species will be um, very difficult ones and I think likely to rise. I do think, to answer your question more simply, I do think some legislatures will say there are particular species we're going to provide complete prote protection for as a result of some of these cases. I think that's a very likely result. <coughs> It's an uh, unbelievably fascinating issue. It just brings up the whole thing, doesn't it? The whole question of animal law, of why we treat them differently and under what circumstances we can and, and can we? Is there any way to treat them differently? But anyway, uh, before, rather than me going on and on, David Casuto has a question. This is a, an all professor, all the time panel. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Uh, so so I, I, this religious exemption issue, say, Marianne, is fascinating on every level. One question I have that I've been thinking about since the Lukumi case is what, um, whether you think the Supreme Court is on a collision course to have to decide what is and isn't a religion. Because anybody, if it can be Bob's religion and bar and grill, then <laughs> can do, anybody can do anything, anytime. So... Uh, <laughs> The short answer is yes, and, and the longer answer is the reason the court's going to be confronted with that issue actually has less to do with the First Amendment and, and more to do with uh, these Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, because the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act at the federal level and then the 21 states that have their own grant a right to religious exemption straight up. So you don't need to show there's some other secular exemption that then triggers your right to religious exemption. You just have a right to a religious exemption. And that has become, it, it used to not be very controversial. When it, we were talking about the Amish keeping their kids home from school and Sabbatarians taking Saturday as the Sabbath, uh, people wearing yarmulkes, notwithstanding no headgear rules in basketball leagues, things like that. They may, there may have been controversial cases, but they weren't politically charged partisan controversies. We now have some very politically charged partisan controversies, the Hobby Lobby case being the most extreme example, I think. Um, as more aggressive and um, ambitious religious exemption claims are made under RIFRA, I think courts are going to feel some pressure to decide, well, what is religion? And how many claimants are we allowing to make these claims? So far, the courts have been very reluctant to do that. That it's not their business, so long as someone is sincere, it's not their business to decide um, what is or isn't a religion. But I, I do think there's gonna be a tension because of these laws granting some very, very strong rights to exemptions from laws. And this is why Justice Scalia in the Smith case said this is all crazy. We can't do this. We'd have anarchy if we allowed people to get exemptions from generally applicable laws because they say it's in the name of their religion. But then in response to Smith, Congress passed a law saying, no, they have that right. And that's where we are. Justin, I wonder if you could give us um, a kind of status report on the ag gag laws right now. And Particularly, I'm interested in the states that are trying to get around the First Amendment by, or just how they're trying to get around the First Amendment. Sure. I mean, the. The quick status is just, as you know, that the Idaho case is on appeal in the Ninth Circuit. Um, the uh, North Carolina, there's a North Carolina case that is, um, has been pending since, I think we filed a response to a motion to dismiss in June or early July, and there's been no hearing set, and no action taken at all. Um, there is. Um, a summary judgment hearing uh, in Salt Lake in, Utah, in the Utah case on the 25th of this month. And um, the Wyoming case, which is sort of quasi a gag, but different for reasons that we could, we could talk about. It has, it's, it's, a, it's a data um, gathering statute, but has some of the same impacts, uh, had a, a, a really unfavorable ruling from a judge in the District of Wyoming. And um, that case, uh, the opening brief is due, I, I want to say the first week of November. 
Um, so that's sort of the, the basic test. In all of those cases, the states are taking some version of the argument that I'm saying. I think that they are all arguing that these laws are generally applicable. Um, some of the states are taking the view that um, the secondary effects of these laws should offset any of the other constitutional content-based concerns. So because we have such an interest in food security and the like, I mean, that, that's, it's either been raised by an amicus or by the state in every one of the cases too. Um, and that, or, you know, employee loyalty, I mean, other secondary effects too, but, but those have come up in basically every case. Um, and a sort of, you know, um, don't worry about the First Amendment, like this is different, which we have made that argument in other contexts too, is, is also sort of implicit, right? You know, I mean, in, a, in a, court of, a trial court or a court of appeals, you don't say ignore the prior law, but they sort of say like this is so different and this is a protection that you see that same kind of argument that was made in amicus briefs to the Supreme Court and Stevens and other things. Like, this is just new. This is like so offensive what they're doing um, that you have to prohibit it. Um, so the, they're both for Tim. Um, the first is you were analogizing the religiously focused statements made in Lukumi and in Kora's case. And in Lukumi, they, those were statements were made on the legislative record at the time the ordinance was passed, whereas in the Kora's case, they're made in the in the pleading. So just to clear, I was not, you're absolutely right that some statements were made in the legislative context in the city of Hiawea that were troubling and that the court relied, well, two members of the court, I should say, relied on in the Lukumi decision. I was actually not referring to those statements. I was referring to statements by members of the Humane Society and another anti-cruelty organization about uh, the Church of Santa Maria during the litigation of the case. Okay. And are you suggesting that those statements have legal significance or just that they affect the gestalt and how the case is perceived? I think to the extent they end up in legal documents, and here they do. I mean, here, under the guise of religion has been in both of the complaints brought, um, that's, that's a problem. Um, you know, you going, going to the court and, and saying, and questioning someone's religion is a really bad strategy right now. Even if it's under a statute that is unquestionably was not passed with religious bias. I think they're two different issues, and I don't know that it speaks to the issue of the legislative intent. I think that's your point, is it doesn't speak, but someone making, I, I see what you're saying. This is a good point, which is, although it may not be a good strategy in front of judges to be questioning someone else, else's religion, um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not relevant to the underlying question of was when the statute enacted, was it in, animated by bias? You're absolutely right. It wouldn't speak to that issue. So presumably, it shouldn't affect that legal question. You're absolutely right. I, I would say it's a bad strategy to go into court and question someone's religion unless, you know, there really is a case that it's insincere. But I, I think the argument that what's occurring with this practice is not a sincere religious belief um, is not a winning argument. But that's a good clarification. Thank, Thank you. Um, and I, I agree with you. <laughs> um, the second is a follow-up to the question Justin asked you. So if if the Supreme Court were to say if there's an exemption, you would have a religious exemption, and then say a local um, city council were to amend their ordinance to get rid of all exemptions in response to that, would that not clearly be targeting religious practices? Because it's, it's like, well, the Supreme Court said this, if we want to cover this. <laughs> <laughs> there is no generally applicable law. That, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and then go, ties to a, another fascinating and very difficult question is what is intent? What is discriminatory intent? How do we prove discriminatory intent? Um, I, I think that a, a city could, in very good faith, and the court would have to accept this if it was true, say, you know, we have decided that protecting animals is a compelling interest that trumps all other interests, whether the claimant is religious or not, and we've decided to have an across the board ban. I mean, in, in some way, because what they'll be getting rid of is not the religious exemption alone. What they'll be getting rid of is a secular exemption that probably had some political capital behind it in the first place. You know, you'd have to get rid of a hunting exemption or an exemption of killing for food. Again, that may be possible in small communities. I think there's very little chance of that happening at the statewide level uh, at this point. Uh, I think we have time for one more. 
We don't really, but I'm pretending we do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this question could be answered by uh, either of you. Uh, have either of you seen any evidence in a uh, post Hobby Lobby world of uh, corporate commercial enterprises attempting to sort of sacralize their operations to be able to take advantage of uh, these sorts of uh, opportunities? <laughs> Under the guise of religion, I'll stay out of that. <laughs> I, I have not, although there was one litigant, you know, there were many cases, Hobby Lobby was the lead case, but there were a number of for-profit corporations involved, and there was one company, I can't remember the name of the particular company, in which the, the head of the company made it pretty clear in an interview that this wasn't about religion, it was about not letting Obama tell him what to do and uh, more of a libertarian argument against it, and yet it was a RIFRA claim that was brought. And so the spirit of that particular case and that particular owner, I wonder you know, if we might see something similar in the future. To the extent, I mean, RIFRA gives a right that would be very valuable to libertarians if it extended beyond religion. So there's sort of a natural tendency to want to seize upon the RIFRA right, I think. And potentially vegans too, right? I mean, this yeah. is what, uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, this is the strongest foothold for veganism as religion. If the refers. Yep. <laughs> yep. Strange bedfellows. We'll end on that note. Uh, thank you so much. We did manage to cram an enormous amount of information into an hour.